Okay, welcome back. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. So this will be our last uh, a session of lectures for the winter school, and then this evening we'll have uh, the poster session. And um, we've had uh, a number of different talks from different areas uh, of optics, or some of the fields of optics at least. So yesterday we had some nice uh, introduction and Discussions on optical engineering and photonics, and this morning you heard a little bit about imaging science, some of the activities taking place here in the college as well. And in this last session, uh, we will talk a little bit about optical physics and some related experiments. So I'll kick it off with a little introduction to that, some experiments I found interesting in that field, and we'll have uh, some talks uh, in, in this area that follow that. Um, let's see if there's any other announcements. I think uh, we'll go ahead and get started with that. So uh, all these different fields utilize different models for describing light. Right? So we have a geometrical optical picture of light. can be very convenient for ray tracing, efficient, things like that. Or we treat light as a ray. Uh, in physical optics, we treat light as a wave. There's polarization, amplitude. And in quantum optics, uh, we can treat light as both a wave or a particle. Okay? Uh, in optical physics, uh, we use a combination of these models, probably most often the physical optics picture. Uh, quite often quantum optics, and so we'll hear a little bit more about quantum optics uh, from the next speaker. Um, here I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about not just uh, light, but what's very important in this field is the interaction of light with matter, and which model is most appropriate in those different interactions. Uh, how can you generate different light sources? What are the properties of the light sources? How can you generate light at different wavelengths? How can you control light-matter interaction? Uh, to understand it at a more basic level or to do useful things. Um, so a brief outline of the talk uh, is I'm going to review something probably a lot of you have, have seen already, right? Which is, I think I skipped to describe this, uh, the classical electron oscillator model. Right? So when we talk about different models for light-matter interaction, uh, the so-called classical picture then is we use a classical light field and classical physics to describe matter. In the semi-classical picture, we use classical light field, electromagnetic wave, and a quantum description of matter, so a quantum description of the atom, for example. And in a full quantum picture, we would treat both the light and the atom quantum mechanically. So we'll review the all-classical picture, and just want to highlight and refresh your memory, or maybe you haven't actually gone through it, of what it predicts very well and what it doesn't predict at all. And then also review what's known as the semi-classical model. Probably some of you have seen that as well, maybe not all of you, uh, where we treat uh, light classically, but we have a quantum mechanical picture for the atom. And then just review what that predicts in terms of different phenomena that are important in optical physics and what it doesn't predict. And then building upon that, you can get a pretty good description on the basics of laser operation. And I've highlighted a few things that I'll talk about uh, with respect to lasers and the use of lasers as pre precision tools in uh, optical physics. Okay. So stop me uh, anytime as we go through that. So just to review, uh, this, this simple picture by Lorentz of the classical oscillator model. Um, now the key point here is it's not a model for the atom, it's a model for light matter interaction. And we just assume that we have an electron that's attached by a spring to the proton. That's a simple model. And so the only force on that electron is just the spring. And so we have this linear displacement force characterized by a spring constant k. And that, we can describe that as in terms of some characteristic frequency. And we turn on the light field, then we have a Lorentz force, the electromagnetic field interacting with that electron. Okay. So the model is very simple. We just equate the forces, like Newton showed us. Uh, we get a differential equation uh, describing the response of the position of that electron. Now, if we shut off the light field at some point, then we get just simple harmonic motion, right, that you expect from a spring uh, with a characteristic oscillation frequency omega naught. Now we can add to the model to make it slightly more realistic uh, a damping term, some force that looks like a fictitious friction force. And the strength of that force will characterize by some strength B. So why might we add this to the model? If we shine light on a group of atoms and shut it off, it might start oscillating, but we would expect it to decay and not just oscillate forever, right? And why, why would we expect it to decay? Pretty, pretty simple. 
induced dipoles. Well, for one thing, if it's an oscillating electron, it's going to be emitting radiation. Right? So it's going to have to lose energy and decay. And we're really not describing a single atom here, but we want to describe an ensemble of atoms. And if we have an ensemble of atoms, you know, at room temperature, they're usually colliding. And so the oscillation of each of these atoms uh, might eventually come out of phase. So the macroscopic quantities that this picture describes uh, can decay for different mechanisms. Collisions, uh, radiation of the energy, things like that. So you can put in this, uh, this damping term in this uh, classical electron oscillator model and come up with this nice uh, differential equation where you have a damped and driven simple harmonic oscillator. And this very simple model gets a lot of phenomena, especially off-resonant phenomena, uh, right. Uh, predicts the average dipole response from an ensemble of atoms in a lot of situations. Uh, so with this uh, displacement of the electron, uh, we can get, because it has a charge, uh, the dipole moment for that system. And from uh, E and M, classical physics, we can relate that to the polarizability of the atomic ensemble. Okay. Also from uh, classical E and M, then we can relate that polarizability to the index refraction. Okay. So the simple model predicts our index refraction, the absorption and dispersion of the light field. Uh, the width of the resonance of these atoms then depends on that decay term, uh, beta, which is related to B, a bit of detail. It also predicts other phenomena like Rayleigh scattering, and even polarization from Rayleigh scattering. So Rayleigh scattering, remember, we heard a little bit about already today. Uh, the scattered power goes as one over lambda to the fourth. And so it scatters away uh, um, the blue light more quickly. So it accounts for a lot of phenomena, but it fails to predict some important things that we want to study in optical physics. Uh, fails to predict saturation of the absorption. Right? There's nothing that saturates here. It continues to scatter light no matter how hard you drive the atoms. Uh, there's really no mechanism for optical gain. And there's certainly nothing related to spontaneous emission. All right? Well, there's something related to it in the decay term. But it doesn't really accurately account for spontaneous emission. And in fact, we don't really have a model of the atom. There's no discrete energy levels to begin with. Right. So to describe uh, this phenomenon, we need a better realistic model for the atom. In this picture. Okay, so let's review. Uh, I think probably a lot of you have had, maybe not all of you, but quantum mechanics, introductory quantum mechanics. You've probably heard about the wave particle, a wave particle duality of quantum mechanics. So let's review that and apply it then and review a simple model for the hydrogen atom. Everyone know who this is? It's not a, I should have built this up photon by photon like Lars, right? <laughs> you guess. Any guesses? De Broglie, right. So if we're going to talk about matter waves, first one that comes to mind. Uh, so the De Broglie wavelength describes this matter-like property, uh, this wave-like property of matter. Right? So we have Whatever this wavelength is for matter, whatever that meant, it's, he wrote it down as Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle. So if uh, particles have wave-like properties, we would expect phenomena that we see with the light fields, right? Like interference and diffraction and things like that. So this was back in 1927, so 1924, I guess, when he wrote that. That was his PhD thesis, by the way. So that's raising the bar pretty high for, for some reason. <laughs> and would want to have been a classmate. Uh, but there should be a lot of analogous things then that we could see with, with the light field. So let's review one, a very familiar phenomenon, and that's a two-slit diffraction pattern. If we have a coherent light source, monochromatic light source, as a plane wave, and it's incident upon these two slits, we'll see these fringes of constructive, destructive interference in the far field. Okay. We'll get constructive interference whenever the path from each of these slits constructively interferes. And we can write down a simple expression for that. And then they destructively interfere when the path length is out of phase. So do you see this um, if in matter waves, right? If I threw, you know, 100 baseballs through two holes, you wouldn't expect to see interference, for, right? And that has to do with the momentum that I can throw it and the size of the objects. But if we go to very tiny objects like electrons, you know, quantum mechanics behaves in, in this world of, the, of this small and ultra-cold objects. Uh, we can do these type of experiments. So this was done uh, initially with electrons in crystals. Uh, this is a more modern reproduction of the same experiment, where a beam of slow and collimator electrons are sent one by one through two slits. And then detected, the detector isn't important here, but detected on a screen. 
And of course, the, uh, the startling thing about the experiment is that it's one particle, because it's just intuitive to think of electrons as particles, uh, hits the screen at a time. And yet, as we watch it build up, we start to see the same interference pattern that you'd get as if it were a continuous wave. So this leads to all sorts of problems and questions and complete loss of intuition, right? Which slit did the particle go through and things like that? How do you accurately describe this phenomenon? And this, is, this was, you know, in old quantum theory, it was really a patchwork of different things trying to get it right, trying to get the experiments to make sense based on adding something quantum-like to their, to their theories right? until more coherent theory developed. Um, so how do they eventually now describe these matter waves? Uh, so we have some key postulates in quantum mechanics. You've probably heard of these. Right? One is our wave function. And it's, it's that the wave function describes everything we can possibly know about the particle. Right? That's it. You write down the wave function. That is all that is knowable about that particle. And well, what is this wave function? How do we interpret it? Uh, classical interpretation is born statistical interpretation. And that is that it's a probability amplitude distribution, this wave function. So in one dimension, if we want to know the probability for locating the particle, if we do a measurement, between two positions, x1 and x2, we just take the modulus squared of the wave function and integrate over that region of space. It's a probability density function. These are postulates because they get the experiments right in the end. Uh, they don't build upon anything else. What about a, a wave equation for these matter waves? Well, yeah, the light field, we have Maxwell's equations, right? We, starting with Maxwell's equations, we can write down the wave equation. And we have this differential equation. We can look for solutions. Right? So two easy solutions are plane waves, spherical waves. Uh, do we see the same thing with particles? Uh, we do. But what's the wave equation? Well, hopefully everyone knows or has heard of the, Schro the Schrodinger equation. Right? This is a postulate of quantum mechanics. We can't really derive it. We can motivate it. But ultimately, uh, it's a postulate that accurately describes experiments. And this is the wave equation for matter. Uh, just a simple differential equation. Now, for those problems where the potential that the particle feels is time independent, uh, we can simplify it into what's known as uh, a time independent Schrodinger equation. Right? So we have a Hamiltonian operator operating on the eigenstates of the system. These are the stationary states. And there's certain stationary fixed eigen energies for each eigenstate. And the Hamiltonian is just the total of the kinetic and the potential energy that the particle feels. So let's just do the simplest example in one dimension, particle in free space. Uh, well, v goes to 0. We can rearrange the differential equation, solve for the wave function as a function of x. And one of the solutions would just be our plane wave solution, just like we have with light. So we can have uh, wave functions that describe the position of our electron. It looks like a plane wave. The wave function goes through both slits as long as we're not detecting it. There's another postulate you know of that if you detect it, it changes things. Right? But the wave function goes through both slits. And then when we measure it on the screen, the interference we see comes from the wave function passing through both slits of that two-slit system. So now we can use this basic theory for the hydrogen atom. So in the hydrogen atom, we have our proton, our electron. And if we only consider the Coulomb potential, this 1 over r potential, then we can solve for the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And we can, it's a nice, it's analytical solution. Right? You don't get that that often in quantum mechanics. So you have these beautiful solutions. You can solve for the energy eigenstates and the eigenenergies for this three-dimensional system. And that's something that uh, uh, you'll work through if you haven't already. And so what do you find? Here's a, here's a graphic of the solution. Here's the 1 over r potential that binds the electron to the proton. Uh, the ground state, now n equals 1, where n is the quantum number. Uh, and for this, uh, these are the uh, energy eigenstates, psi sub n. I won't write it out. And these are the energies. So when n is equal to 1, uh, the electron's in the ground state, and it's bound in that system by this potential energy, minus 13.6 electron volts. So it takes that much energy to rip the electron off. Right? In the first excited state, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, all the way up to the point where it's completely uh, ionized, where the electron's taken away. 
It's a very nice, uh, simple picture. Now, the uh, difference between these energy levels um, can be probed with light. Right? So if we're up, uh, or it can give off um, that energy in the form of light. So if we're in an excited state of the hydrogen atom, it drops down to the ground state, it can release that energy in the form of a photon, right? a light field. And we can write down uh, that same energy expression in terms of the wavelength, where the energy per photon is h bar, nu, the frequency, convert that to wavelength. And so this is the same thing, but we're writing in terms of the wavelength of light that would be given off when the hydrogen atom makes a transition from one of these levels to a lower level. And that's called the Rydberg formula. It's very simple. And so the Rydberg uh, constant is a fundamental constant. And 1 over lambda, the, that wavelength, is just the Rydberg constant times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. And if you calculate the wavelengths then between these different transitions, uh, and the ground state, it's called uh, the Lyman lines. And if you look here, uh, the wavelength from n equals 1 to n equals 2 is around 121 nanometers. Okay. So now that's in the vacuum ultraviolet. At around 200 nanometers, 180 nanometers, oxygen atoms in the air start to absorb light. So if you go any lower in wavelength than that, they call it the vacuum ultraviolet. Because in order to propagate any light, you have to suck out all the air be in a vacuum. So it's very hard, actually, to generate light at 121 nanometers. But you can observe light emitted from these atoms at 121 nanometers. So very early on, uh, since the development of quantum theory, uh, spectroscopic measurements of atoms and molecules have been used to test quantum theory. Right? Just looking at the light emitted from these atoms showed discrete energy levels. So they knew there was something wrong with classical theory. And this is referred to as the Bohr model of the atom. You get these same energy levels by making different assumptions. But you can measure now very accurately these different transitions and see if it matches the quantum theory. So spectroscopy has long been used as a test of, uh, of quantum theory since the early 1900s. Um, of course, one problem uh, is generating light at these wavelengths. But in terms of detecting the emitted radiation, it's, um, it's very doable. Right? You can detect 120 nanometers. But the story is not quite so simple. Of course, that's a very nice uh, picture of the hydrogen atom. But if you want to probe deeper and you want to probe quantum theory even more, uh, the hydrogen atom gets very complicated very quickly. So let me remind you or introduce you to a few of the more complicated features of the hydrogen atom and the predictions for it. Uh, so here's our uh, simple two energy levels, ground state first excited state, if we only take the Coulomb potential into account with the Schrodinger equation. Now, if you add relativity to the mix, uh, you get a slightly different equation, and you get other quantum effects uh, that pop out of this. And what you find is that things get complicated very quickly. Right? In this picture, uh, the spin angular momentum of the electron jumps out. So has everyone heard of the spin of the electron? Sure, yeah. Right. So it's an intrinsic angular momentum. It's an intrinsic property of the electron. And so it doesn't just have this charge. It has an intrinsic angular momentum. It also has an orbital angular momentum, at least in a classical sense, as it goes around the proton. So now if we want to talk about the total angular momentum of the electron, it has the orbital angular momentum, and now it has this intrinsic spin angular momentum. And those two angular momenta can interact with each other. And that leads to an interaction energy, which can split the energy levels. And that's what we see here. Now this S and P and all these other numbers, a spectroscopic notation, S has to do with the orbital angular momentum of that electron. S means it has none. The quantum number is zero. L means the quantum number is one, and it has some orbital angular momentum. So when the orbital angular momentum is zero, S, uh, there's no orbital spin interaction because there's no orbital angular momentum. So it changes the energy level from this theory, but it doesn't get split. But for this state, it gets split into two energy levels, depending on the orientation of the spin of the electron and the uh, orbital angular momentum. Um, so in this theory now, the energy levels depend on n, but also on a new quantum number, j, which corresponds to the total angular momentum of the electron. Now, I'll throw a few more complications up here. You don't have to follow it. But the point is it gets, uh, it gets pretty tricky. Uh, this looked very good. Uh, but some measurements were made uh, by Willis Lamb uh, and, and colleagues back in 1947. 
And they found that one of these energy levels, uh, which they thought would be degenerate for two different quantum states, was actually split. And they measured this, and it's referred to as a Lamb shift. Uh, it comes out of field theory. It's a little uh, tricky to explain. But the basic idea is that empty space is not so empty after all. So quantum electrodynamics enters into the, into the theory and predicts a shift of the ground state and a splitting of these two quantum states that would have otherwise been degenerate. And it gets more complicated if you consider the fact that the proton also has a spin. Now you have the angular momentum of the electron interacting with the angular momentum of the proton. And you get additional level splits. So these are all different models that you have to add to the quantum theories and, and quantum electrodynamics to get the energy levels of this very simple two-particle atom correct. So, uh, you know, from the early 1900s, people have been trying to make accurate measurements of the hydrogen atom to, to test quantum theory. Uh, now, if you just look at the emission of the spectral lines, that gets you only so far. Eventually, you'll run out of resolution, and you won't be able to see these very small splittings in the hydrogen atom. Um, now, this isn't just something that happened in the 1930s and 1940s. These measurements continue today. Uh, in fact, um, to make really precise measurements in these systems uh, requires now ultra-stable lasers. So we don't just look at the emitted light. We probe the atoms very carefully to try and measure these small shifts. And the atoms don't just sit there and, and play nice. They're moving around. They're colliding. They're moving out of your laser beam. And this all makes it difficult. So there's been a lot of developments of laser cooling, and laser trapping that have greatly assisted in precision spectroscopy. Okay. Uh, so these are all tools in the field of optical physics. And um, they also get at a better fundamental understanding of light matter interaction. As I said, it's still going on today, right? So this is one that's still in the headlines, very interesting experiments. Uh, we talked a little bit about hydrogen. Now, if you replace the electron with a muon, what's a muon? Well, it's just like an electron, except that it's um, very different mass. It's 200 times heavier than the electron. So they call it muonic hydrogen. It doesn't live quite as long. But you can make it, and you can probe it. So if you take the same theory, you should be able to predict only the mass changes, what do these energy levels look like? And in fact, if you measure this Lamb shift that I mentioned before, you can get at a quantity, eventually, that you're limited by, is the radius of the proton. Now, they've been measuring the radius uh, of the proton by measuring the Lamb shift in hydrogen for a long time. They've come up with a radius for the, they call it an RMS radius for the proton because it's actually made up of quarks and it's kind of a fuzzy little ball too. Uh, and it's very small, right? 0.8 femtometers. So it's, it's not actually measured this way. Uh, they, they measure it with lasers, right? But then recently someone measured it. It was, 20, it was before 2010. Uh, 20, well, this, this came out in 2010. Uh, but they measured muonic hydrogen. And they found if they did the same calculations, uh, they found a very different number for the radius of the proton, okay? seven sigma away. And so they've been testing this and testing this to try and figure out, is it new physics? Are there QED corrections we didn't do right? Did someone make a mistake in the lab? Um, in 2016, they still don't know. And there's more and more evidence showing that it's not a mistake. But it's a still a very active area of research. So people are still using precision spectroscopic measurements to continue to test fundamental physics. So it's a very um, exciting area. OK, so we have a model of the atom. Uh, we can probe that model with lasers, and there's other techniques to try and test uh, quantum mechanics at very fundamental levels. We can use this now semi-classical picture uh, to get a good idea of a lot of light matter interaction and phenomena, and a really good picture for basic laser operation as well. So let's review what this semi-classical model tells us. So we'll use this uh, Schrodinger equation to describe hydrogen atom. But now the potential won't just have the Coulomb potential, but we're going to turn on a light field so the electron feels both the Coulomb force and the Lorentz force. And then you solve it just like before. Except now it's time dependent. So you have to start making uh, some approximations. And uh, we'll skip over the approximation part. Um, but if you make uh, certain approximations, rotating wave, dipole approximation, uh, two-level atom approximation, other things you might have heard of. Uh, you can come up with an expression for how does this wave function evolve in the presence of the external field. Okay? And now if we start in the ground state, and we didn't look at the wave functions for the ground state, but we know what it is, and we turn on an electric uh, 
magnetic field, the light field, we can look how that, and we assume it's a small perturbation, we can look at how the wave function evolves by solving this expression in time, and eventually it might look like the first excited state, for example. And if we shut off the light field at that time, we'll say, oh, it's made a transition. Because now, with the light field off, it's in the exact same quantum state as the first excited state. And so, what this is, if, if you're familiar with the density matrices, you might already recognize this. But this quantity is just telling us the probability as a function of time, the probability uh, amplitude, as a function of time, that if we start in the ground state, turn on the light field resonant, that will find the atom in the excited state. And what we see is it's sinusoidal, sinusoidal squared, right? So it's a completely coherent interaction. It goes up to the excited state, back down to the ground state, excited state, ground state, and we call those Rabi oscillations. This coherent interaction between light and matter. And um, rather than showing you, reminding you of the equations for that, we can look at uh, a simulation. So this is the ground state um, of the hydrogen atom as represented uh, by the wave function. And here's the uh, energy levels, the ground state energy level, first excited state, and here's the Coulomb potential. And now we can turn on a linearly polarized electric field along the Z direction. Okay? So you'll start to see uh, the electric field strength moving up and down here, and we'll look at uh, the, simulated, the simulation for what happens to the wave function um, in this case. Oh, so it's down here. So there's the light field going back and forth, and it's driving uh, the wave function for a while, and I'll try to, you can see the internal energy of the atom increasing. And I'm going to stop it, I'm going to shut off the light field right when it gets up to the energy of the um, first excited state in the absence of a field. So now if we shut off the laser at this point, now we're back to the field free case, and we're in uh, an eigenenergy state of the hydrogen atom. Right? So this is what the wave function for the first excited state of the hydrogen atom would look like. Right? This is the 2p state. So that's what's linearly polarized light. And if we left on the field instead of stopping it, it would continue to evolve and go back down to the ground state. So you get all these different effects. Uh, you could turn on a light field for a certain amount of time, shut it off, and you leave all the atoms in the same state that they were in. It means no absorption took place. So there's these coherent interactions you can probe and show that this theory is correct in, uh, in optical physics. And we can also go with uh, circular polarization. So now we'll turn on a circularly polarized field. We'll look down the z-axis. So this is our electric field strength going around in circles. It's perturbing our wave function. Um, seems to be rotating it, right? And we'll stop it when this energy level gets up there again. Ah, so now we're in the first excited state, the 2p state. But the atom is going to be in a state where it has angular momentum internally along the z direction. That comes out of the quantum theory. The photons that excited it up to here must have also had that angular momentum. So we have a conservation of energy between the photon that's absorbed and the atom, and there's also conservation of the angular momentum. So our photon would have an angular momentum of this case along the z direction. It gets absorbed by the atom, and now the atom has this internal angular momentum. So you can see all that with these simulations. Give you nice pictures. The different colors are different phases, and uh, you can play with what transitions can we drive in the atom. Right? If the energy and the angular momentum between the light field and the atoms isn't preserved, then it's a forbidden transition. You can't drive it. Okay. So that is the the basics of the semi-classical picture. Hope this comes back. So what does it predict? Uh, well, first of all, we have discrete energy levels for the atom. We know that's good. Um, and it also predicts now optical absorption. Right? And the photons can uh, be converted into the atom. Uh, we can have optical gain. We can put energy into the atom, and we can extract energy from the atom back into the light field. Right? So it accounts for absorption and gain, and also saturation. Uh, if we have multi-level atoms, um, we can pump light up into the excited state, it can decay down to this other state, and we can have gain. But if our light field is too big, it'll drive the population down to the ground state, and we won't have that gain, or we won't have that absorption. 
So now we have saturation in the model. But it doesn't quite predict everything. Uh, if it's in an excited state and we shut off the light field, it stays in that excited state. It's an energy eigenstate of the system. It doesn't predict spontaneous emission. Right? So to predict the phenomena that we observe and know it happens, like spontaneous emission, we have to go to a full quantum picture for the light field. And that gets into the field of quantum optics. Nonetheless, it does a pretty good job of uh, describing the very basics of, of laser operation. So let's just look and review what lasers are, uh, the basic components. And we have gain, optical amplifier. Right? It's very straightforward. And for optical gain, we have to have at least a three-level system. Right? So all different lasers are usually modeled on a three- or a four-level laser system. And there's trade-offs between three- and four-level lasers in terms of efficiency and power output and things like that that we can get into in, in courses. Uh, but the basic idea is that we take atoms that are in the ground state, we add some energy to pump it up to the excited state. We need to transition that quickly decays down to some level that has a long lifetime so that the atom sits with this energy for quite a while until a light field comes along and creates a stimulated emission from that energy level. That's the optical gain. And that stimulated emission, the energy that the atom gives up, is coherent and directional with the, with the light field that comes in. And then we need a feedback mechanism for a laser. Uh, so now we have two mirror cavities, a nice example, where we have uh, the gains provided uh, by the uh, gain material, and we have feedback uh, from two mirrors of the cavity, for example. We need uh, a very stable cavity. The light has to stay within the cavity for a long time. And so we can look at the stability of the cavity. We can look at a ray picture uh, and choose radius of curvature of the mirrors and separation of the mirrors, where if we make an infinite number of bounces of our ray, it stays confined between the mirrors. Uh, you can get the same results by solving the paraaxial equation for cavity stability. And you can look at the uh, modes of the cavity. You can set up paraaxial equation, give it the boundary conditions on what the fields might be here, and one solution is the Hermite Gaussian polynomials. So these are the modes, the eigenmodes, transverse eigenmodes of the, of the laser cavity. So the basic idea uh, is that we create the population inversion. It starts off with some small amount of spontaneous emission. That spontaneous emission goes in every direction, but some of it is along the optical axis of your stable cavity. So it gets, bounces back, and it sees gain. After a while, but eventually it saturates the gain because now it's driving the population from the excited state back down to the ground state until you reach the steady state, which is when the round-trip gain is approximately equal to the round-trip losses. And you have one mirror, of course, that's not 100% reflective, so you can couple a little bit of the light inside the cavity out of the laser system. So you can make these lasers either operate in a continuous wave fashion, where you have a continuous single frequency light field coming out. And so now you have a very high spectral intensity. You can operate on a single frequency, uh, and it can come out with a very high power. So you can really drive transitions in atoms and molecules now since, since its invention. You can also set up the cavity such that rather than a single frequency, uh, you have a short pulse that survives in the cavity. And that pulse will go back and forth and be amplified and reach a steady state, just like the CW field. And each time it hits the cavity mirror, the fraction of the, of the pulse will come out. You can generate a pulse train, and that's called mode locking the laser system. So let's look at some different experiments where these lasers can be used as precision tools. And I'll look a little bit at uh, atomic clocks and show you a very powerful tool uh, known as a femtosecond frequency comb. It's made huge advances in this field of precision spectroscopy the last 10 years, 15 years now. So as I was talking about before, um, the spectroscopy has long been used to test quantum theory. And I like to say it's unveiling the quantum world, right? So since the days of Newton, we've used dispersive elements like gratings and prisms to separate light into different colors and analyze the spectral content of light. And so one example is folks looking at uh, Fraunhofer lines, the absorption of the light from the sun in the solar atmosphere or in the Earth's atmosphere. And we see these discrete absorption lines uh, from the background solar spectrum due to different atoms and molecules. But since uh, around the 1950s or so, with the invention of the maser and the laser uh, after that, uh, we've had the ability to greatly increase the resolution and the precision of these experiments and therefore uh, more precisely test uh, 
the quantum theories that, de uh, that determine what those transitions are. So I mentioned uh, quantum electrodynamics and measurements of the Lamb shift. Uh, the Rydberg constant equation that we showed, it turns out that the Rydberg constant is the most precisely measured constant today. Uh, and now there's other theories that predict, and they're not known for sure, that this fundamental constant alpha, which determines the, the fine structure splitting, uh, could vary with time on very long time scales. I've even heard talks where they're wondering, well, what if it varied on very, sh if it varied on very short time scales and we didn't know it? We need to start recording all of our data. And there's a movement now for all people doing precision measurements to just timestamp your data just in case. What if things were fluctuating quicker than we thought? So there's a lot of interesting things that people are looking at and questioning. And I mentioned the proton uh, charge radius as well. So these all require very, very stable lasers. So what's sort of the state of the art with stable, very narrow line with lasers? Well, here's one example. Uh, and this is uh, an experiment where two CW lasers were taken. Uh, and they were actively stabilized to get rid of all the noise. And then they're uh, beat together. Right? So this is a, like a beat note uh, between two optical fields. Right? So you might be more familiar with acoustic beating between two different frequencies, and you hear the difference frequency between them. It's the same thing with, with light fields. And now this is on a time scale of 30 seconds between two lasers. Now, one oscillation of the laser is about two femtoseconds. And this is showing that you're getting perfect sinusoidal relationship between these two lasers on the time scales of tens of seconds. So this is an incredibly long coherence time between the two lasers. So why would you want that? Well, for precision spectroscopy, for probing these transitions very accurately. This is an example of using this type of laser to measure one hertz line width in an atom, in this case, a strontium atom. Uh, you also need it for things, maybe not quite this stable, but for the LIGO interferometer, where you have very long arms, and we'll hear uh, a keynote talk tomorrow morning about LIGO and probably some of the laser requirements. These are also essential tools for developing next gen generation atomic clocks because the next generation of atomic clocks are based or will be based on optical transitions rather than microwave transitions. So let's uh, talk about that for a moment to see uh, why that might be interesting. So what is an atomic clock? Well, an atomic clock is basically based on a transition in an atom. And right now, the standard everyone agrees on is the hyperfine splitting in the ground state of cesium. And so we're going to assume that if we can realize a cesium atom that's not perturbed, not running into another cesium atom, not under any external field, that its transition frequency is not going to change in time. And now we need to realize what that transition frequency is. So we take what's called a local oscillator. In this case, it would be a microwave source. And you drive that transition on resonance. And you need to keep it on resonance. So you have something, a servo, that keeps it on resonance. And then you take a little bit of the output of this local oscillator. And so you're driving this transition, trying to determine what that frequency is. So right now, for cesium, that's around 9 gigahertz, right? So 9 billion oscillations of the ground state of the cesium atom Count that, stop, everyone agrees that's one second. OK. Um, so that means you can divide up time on very small time scales. And of course, this is useful for timing, for instance. Every satellite in the GPS constellation has a cesium clock on it. Right? And you use it to tell where things are, position, and all relies on these atomic clocks. Uh, but you hit a limit to the stability that you can get from these clocks and the accuracy. And that's maybe about a part in 10 to the 14th. In other words, you can realize this with 14 digits of precision. Well, that's pretty good. But if you go to optical transitions rather than this 9 gigahertz, you can dramatically increase the stability of these clocks by orders of magnitude. Uh, so optical transitions are on the order of 300 terahertz, 400 terahertz. And one way to, to think of that is you're just dividing up time scales more finely. So in one second, instead of counting to 9 billion, uh, you know, you're counting to much higher numbers than the 15th. So while well, there's a lot of things you can do with this, it'll improve uh, positioning systems, uh, deep space exploration. Uh, but then there's a lot of other uh, out of the lab crazy things you can do. Uh, gravity, the gravitational redshift will start showing up. So if you have a stability with an optical clock of part in 10 to the 18th, that means you can count 18 digits, that means something. Uh, and you were to raise that clock one meter up off the table, 
you'd be able to tell that the clock frequency changed. Right? And so people are looking at, can we map out a gravity field of the Earth? Right? Make the Earth look something like this. There's other ways to do it, but having a new technology to do that um, uh, opens up other possibilities. The problem with atomic clocks based on optical transitions is they're based on optical transitions. And you can't count 400 terahertz directly. You can count 9 gigahertz, uh, pretty straightforward with electronics. But hundreds of terahertz, uh, you can't measure directly. Or at least you couldn't until around the year 2000 or so. Uh, and a very powerful tool came along, known as the femtosecond frequency comb. And it's affected not just optical atomic clocks, uh, but the fields of precision spectroscopy. And it's opened up a new field known as attosecond science as well. So let me explain to you the concept behind um, what's known as the femtosecond frequency comb. And I like to say it, it connects the ultra-fast and the ultra-stable. I can never decide which to call it. Or sometimes I say it goes from seconds to femtoseconds. Uh, so let me, say, let me show you what I mean by that. So with the CW laser we mentioned, we can create very spectrally pure, narrow line width sources, right? that just give you a perfect sinusoidal output of the electromagnetic field on the time scales of seconds. Right? So a large number of oscillations. One cycle of this field in the visible spectrum is around two femtoseconds. Now, if we had a mode lock laser that just emitted short pulses of light out of the laser instead, um, if we could generate just a few optical cycle pulses, then they'd be on the order of 10 femtoseconds, 5 femtoseconds, maybe at best two femtoseconds, because then we just have one oscillation. Um, now, we can generate probably down to like four femtoseconds, is sort of state of the art, with, this, with the, like a tie sapphire laser, if any of you use those. Very broad band with tie sapphire laser. And these mode lock lasers then can be used for time resolving things, like uh, uh, decay in molecules and things like that. So you can uh, excite a molecule up to some transition, and you can watch it oscillate, and you can coherently control the uh, molecular transitions in it because of the short time scales that you can generate these pulses. But how, does it, how can these be used to connect the seconds to femtoseconds, and what do we mean by that? Well, let's look at how they're actually related. If we have a single frequency, um, and we look in time, that gives us this sinusoidal oscillation. If we have just one pulse from that pulse train, and it has the same carrier frequency, but it, now it has amplitude modulated, that means it has the same average frequency, but it has a very broad spectrum. And if you've had Fourier transforms, or you're familiar with this relationship, if you have a very short pulse in time, you'll have a very broad spectrum in frequency space, right? So a very short pulse here, very large uncertainty in the frequency here. But what if you have a pair of pulses, not just a single pulse? If they're identical pulses, uh, each pulse will have the exact same spectrum, or at least the amplitude of the spectrum will be the same. However, uh, if they're delayed by a certain amount, there will be a difference in the spectra between the two. The sec second spectrum will have a phase that's different than the first one, a relative phase shift, and that phase shift will be linear in frequency. That means you'll get constructive and destructive interference between uh, the two spectra from the two pulses. Right? So this is a lot like our two-slit interference pattern, where we looked from the near field to the far field. Uh, now we're looking between time and frequency. Those are both related by Fourier transforms. So with these two pulses, we get these spectral interference fringes. The separation between these regions of constructive interference corresponds to one over the time between these two pulses. So if we go from two slits uh, with light to many, many slits, we have a diffraction grating, right? And the more slits in a diffraction grating, the higher the spectral resolution. The same thing in, in this in case in time. If instead of two pulses, we have an infinite pulse train, and we add all the, the spectra associated together with those, you look at the Fourier domain, these uh, regions of constructive interference turn into delta functions. And that's sometimes referred to as uh, the femtosecond frequency comb. Okay. So now if we have pulses that are very short, we can actually cover the entire optical spectrum. We can generate coherent bandwidth from 400 nanometers to one micron. And if we zoom in and we look at that light, we will see these individual frequencies that are separated by the repetition rate of the laser. And they're perfectly equally spaced. So it's like a uh, precise light ruler that we can use to make relative measurements of, of different transitions, very accurate measurements. 
Um, portion of the Nobel Prize uh, was in part awarded to uh, Ted Hench and Jan Hall for uh, the femtosecond frequency scale. Now you might think, we all know Fourier transforms. How do they how do they get a Nobel Prize for uh, this theory? But there's a little bit more to it. Of course, when you're the first one to do anything, uh, it's a lot harder, right, than saying I knew that too. Uh, but there were a lot of reasons. First of all, uh, if you look at successive pulses coming out of a laser, they're not necessarily, there's no reason they're going to be identical. Okay? And why is that? We have a pulse circulating inside the laser cavity, and the pulse envelope travels at the group velocity for the medium, and the carrier frequency travels at the phase velocity. And there's no reason those should be the same. So from one pulse to the next, this carrier envelope phase can be different. Right? So if we look at this phase shift between the uh, carrier frequency and the peak of the envelope, it can change from pulse to pulse, so they're not identical. So first of all, does it totally get dephased from one pulse to the next? Is there a phase relationship? And how do you measure it to begin with? That was the real difficult part of the work. But that's all doable now. And now, so if we take a pulse train that looks like this, uh, we'll still get a spectrum that looks like this. And we have these discrete frequencies that are separated by the repetition rate of the laser. But because of this time-changing phase from one pulse to the other, there can be an overall shift of this femtosecond cone. Right? And now, uh, because of, the, of their contributions, we can measure what that shift is. And that means we can determine the optical frequency of any one of these individual cone teeth of the laser. So you have this mode-locked laser, it has a very broad spectrum of equally spaced frequencies, and you can determine the absolute frequency of any one of those. That's related by this uh, formula. Nu is the optical frequency of one of the comb teeth. It should be nu sub m. It's equal to some integer times the repetition rate of the laser plus this other shift, the offset frequency. It's the same for each comb tooth. And now you can measure that and set that to zero. I won't go into how that happens. But this now relates optical frequencies 400 terahertz to the repetition rate of the laser, you know, 100 megahertz, a gigahertz, something you can easily measure 12 digits with. Multiply it by the correct integer, and there's no uncertainty now for making microwave measurements and relating them to optical measurements. And that's very powerful if you want to make an atomic clock based on an optical transition at 400 terahertz. So it's like the gears of a clock. You have something ticking at 400 terahertz, and you want to count it very accurately. And now you have this gear work that reduces that 400 terahertz down to 100 megahertz that you can easily and accurately count. And now you can really make precise measurements of atomic molecular transitions. You can really push the boundaries on theorists, uh, make them keep working hard. So it's a very precise tool for uh, atomic clocks and precision spectroscopy. That's a little detail I'll skip. So atom an optical atomic clock might look like this. You have a highly stabilized laser. And now you can use a very narrow transition, optical transition, in, a, in an atomic or even a molecular system. And you, if there's a feedback mechanism, you have to keep it on resonance. And to read it out, you just mix it with this femtosecond frequency comb. You lock that one CW laser to one of those comb teeth, and you're basically just counting the repetition rate of the laser. But it has all the stability of the optical transition. There's a lot more to it. And in this field, there's a lot of different tools one needs for the laser stabilization for the laser cooling and trapping of the atoms that you'll use. Um, but it's really uh, led to the development of some uh, really amazing systems. I said this also impacted a field known as attosecond science. Uh, and this is the field where you're measuring very short events in time. And it works like this. Uh, it was originally really developed for these optical atomic clocks. But if we can detect these frequencies that make up the pulses, that means we can control what those pulsed waveforms look like. And if we can detect these frequencies and control them, that means we can control what the, uh, what the pulses look like and know what the pulses look like in time. If we can set the, uh, I don't want that there, if we can set this offset frequency to zero, that means we can really generate pulses that are all identical. So let me show you what I mean. Before around 2000, people could generate very, very short pulses of light but they kind of looked like this. They didn't really know what the phase was, and no one really talked about it. It really didn't mean anything, and nothing could do with it, so it really wasn't simulated. Right. With the frequency comb, it means that we can set each pulse to be identical. And now we can make use of that carrier frequency in the phase. Right. So now you have access to sub-cycle timing of the field. So one cycle is about two femtoseconds. 
if you can tell exactly what the phase of the pulse is, and now you have access to sub-femtoseconds. That's attosecond time scales. So now this has opened up a field where people can do uh, some really amazing experiments. If one cycle, if the pulse is short enough and you can control the phase, if one cycle of the pulse is just above, say, the tunneling ionization threshold for an atom, that's going to rip the electron off the atom. I mean, you can control which direction you rip the atom off of, whether you ionize it to the right or you ionize it to the left. I think that's amazing. And here's an experiment showing it. This is the detector that detects whether it's ionized to the left or the right, and this is showing um, that probability, left minus right, going back and forth. Uh, you can also uh, affect um, exactly when, if you ionize it, when that electron returns back and might collide with the ion core. So people are doing amazing experiments where they take the electron off and they rescatter it off of the ion, and they measure the electron diffraction pattern. So they use the atom itself as the electron source for elect electron diffraction experiments. Okay. All because of this exquisite control over the electromagnetic field uh, that really started from a different field of uh, precision spectroscopy. Now one thing my group and others have been working on for the past 10 years is taking this uh, femtosecond frequency comb tool and trying to extend it to the vacuum ultraviolet and the extreme ultraviolet. So these days you can fairly easily generate this frequency comb, this coherent light. Around one micron, your laser might be here, and you can really extend it across the visible. So this is an actual picture we took of the, of the light coming from the laser. But these simple atoms and molecules, like the hydrogen atom we talked about, their transitions, I remember it was 121 nanometers for that first excited state of hydrogen. And a lot of molecules, molecular ions, the trans there's a lot of interesting transitions down here. Uh, but we don't have these precision spectroscopic tools down there. Um, it's very hard to measure the 1s to 2p state in hydrogen. And only one group's really done it that well. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting things um, down here. And another one is this nuclear transition in thorium atom that a lot of people have been looking at uh, for decades. Um, now it's believed to be around 160 nanometers. It's really the only example of something that might be accessible. It was an actual rearrangement of a nucleus of a particular isotope in thorium. And the possibility for uh, actually being able to drive a nuclear transition with the laser source is, is very tantalizing for some of us. And there's, there's possibilities for how to turn these into clocks as well. Um, so there's a lot of interesting uh, physics, science, astrophysics, maybe even nuclear transition one could look at if we could translate these laser tools into the vacuum ultraviolet region of the spectrum. Now really today, uh, it's really dominated still by Newton's dispersive systems spectrometers with gratings or prisms. Right? And this is just a, a spectrometer for the vacuum ultraviolet light. You can generate intense sources of VUV light at large user facilities, but they are, don't have the coherence of laser systems. They don't, you won't get the spectral resolution, so you end up using a spectrometer, just like in the days of Newton, although more expensive. Um, so that's sort of been the goal, uh, is to translate these laser sources into precision tools in the vacuum ultraviolet. Now, there's a very common way people can upconvert the laser light from the visible portion of the spectrum into the vacuum ultraviolet. And that's been done since around 1990s with just amplified laser pulses. And uh, it's kind of an interesting process, so let me just finish up showing this. And it's called high harmonic generation. Has anyone heard of high harmonic generation? How about second harmonic generation? Okay, so that's more common, right? Second harmonic generation is the nonlinear response of an electron that stays bound to an atom. And you drive it hard enough, and you start to get, like, overtones from a bell, right? You get a nonlinear response, and you can generate second harmonic, maybe third harmonic. High harmonic generation is when you actually rip off that electron and rescatter it with the ion. So you need a very intense pulse, high energy pulse to focus down into a gas jet, and you can generate collinearly very high photon energies down in the vacuum and extreme ultraviolet. You have to use a gas jet because otherwise it gets reabsorbed if it's a solid material. How it works um, can be explained in a pretty simple model. They call it three-step model. First model is uh, tunneling ionization. The electric field changes that potential during one cycle. It changes this as the Coulomb potential. It allows it to tunnel and ionize. And now you have this intense field that accelerates that electron away from the ion core, gives it a lot of energy, and then it changes phase, right, two femtoseconds later, 
and the electron goes back and recollides with the ion. And during that recollision, it might just scatter. It actually does about 100,000 other things, but every once in a while, it recombines down to the ground state, and that energy is given off as a photon, a very high energy. And this happens over several cycles, repeatedly and in a coherent way. And so you can generate actually coherent light, coherent with respect to the input, down into the vacuum ultraviolet at odd harmonics of the fundamental. Now, the bound nonlinear response that you would get from classical nonlinear optics would predict that it would go to zero very quickly. This is really only limited by the intensity of the light field and the binding energy of the, of the atom that you choose. Um, the problem is if you try and do this with this high repetition rate pulse train, the energy per pulse is too low to drive this nonlinear process. So we've been working on a system where we have uh, a resonant optical cavity. We couple in uh, the frequency comb into this resonant optical cavity, and we can build it up a thousand times in terms of the energy. So we can build up to 10 kilowatts of average power with 50 femtosecond to 100 femtosecond pulses, and we can drive this high harmonic generation. And we've been able to upconvert the frequency comb into the vacuum ultraviolet. And other groups have already shown that this light maintains all these same coherent properties of the frequency comb uh, if, it's, if it's done properly. Um, so this is just a schematic showing the ionization of the gas jet. To get the light out is a bit of a challenge. We have a sapphire plate at Brewster's angle inside the cavity. It took us a long time to figure out how not to burn and damage that. And now it doesn't burn and damage. Uh, and so at 60 nanometers, for example, what used to be Brewster's angle because of dispersion now has a 10% Fresnel reflection. So our 10% output coupler for the higher harmonics is about as good as we can do. And the rest gets absorbed in the sapphire. Um, and so that's what we're working on now, actually, is to do procedures at crosscopy in the vacuum ultraviolet with the source. Uh, I did have one last thing I wanted to say, an example of these sources, uh, the frequency comb. But it has to do rather with the broad bandwidth of the, of the comb and not these high peak intensities that we can generate. This is a project where we're using the broad bandwidth to analyze laser-induced plasmas. So in two slides here. Uh, the goal is to make a measurement of multiple species at once by using the broad bandwidth of the laser. So say you have a material and you want to know what the composition is or you want to know if there's a particular thing in it, uh, you can ablate that material with a high energy pulse, an ablation laser, and you can generate off this target sample a little plasma. And then you can probe with the laser to see if it gets absorbed or not, to see if the atom you're looking for was there. Other, uh, another approach is to look at the emission that comes from this sample. But with emission, you don't have the same spectral resolution. So we've been trying an approach where we're using frequency combs to probe this laser-induced plasma. Uh, and here's why. Uh, with this very broad bandwidth, we can see multiple transitions simultaneously. So when you first generate the plasma, you have a lot of ions that form. And those ions have very different transitions than the neutrals. But these ions eventually uh, recollide and reform into neutrals on certain time scales. And then later on, they might form into molecules. But these all have very different transitions. But with the broad bandwidth of the frequency comb, it's possible to see uh, these different transitions simultaneously. So the goal that we haven't reached yet, uh, some aspects we have, is to look at uh, what was in the material and how it evolves in time. What's the distribution of ions to neutrals to molecules? Uh, the details aren't important, but it takes actually two of these lasers. This is a heterodyne beat note between this laser and this laser, so we can detect the frequency spectrum very easily from the probe laser. So uh, one thing we look at is... Uh, rubidium, for example. As a test, we send one laser through the rubidium cell. Rubidium is very common to a, a lot of AMO labs. Uh, and there's some really strong transitions uh, known as D2 lines. And there's two different isotopes of rubidium. And from these initial results, we can look at the uh, spectrum of the frequency comb. And we can see these uh, D2 lines and the different isotopes of rubidium directly. Now, this is just a portion of the spectrum. What we actually detect simultaneously goes on and on and on and on. And on. So we could really see the D1 line up at 790 nanometers and the D2 line. We could also see potassium if it were in there down at uh, 760 nanometers. So we could see multiple things simultaneously, and that's, that's sort of the goal. Uh, 
Uh, we took a piece of calcite, for example. Uh, calcite has about 1% of rubidium in a lot of samples. Well, that didn't show up well. Uh, but this is when we, uh, we tried it with uh, laser ablation of calcite, and we can see those same uh, isotopic shifts in the D2 line of rubidium. And uh, isotopes are very interesting. If you have the ability to resolve isotopes, uh, being able to tell isotopic ratios can tell you a lot about, well, if something's enriched, for example, but also a lot about chemical reactions that have taken place in that material. So isotopic analysis with, with this laser-induced plasma is a, maybe a more applied application of these, one example of a more applied application of the frequency combs. Okay, with that, I guess I better stop. So I'll take any questions, and we'll quickly move on to the next speaker. We'll actually have a break, so that's good, uh, before the next talk. So if there's no questions, oh, maybe one. Why, um, 